But let's go ahead. We need to pray as we begin. So let's pray together. Father in heaven, we're just grateful that you have given to us your word. We thank you for the opportunity these past few weeks that we've had to study together. We know that you've been with us, that you have uh, spoken to our hearts. And we pray that you'll be with us tonight as we study once again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so tonight we're going to be talking about Revelation's Remnant. Now, if you notice, the picture here has a, a lady and a dragon and a, a moon, right? So sometimes I've called this the moon, the maid, and the monster. So you pick whatever title you want to look at, but uh, Revelation's Remnant, the moon, the maid, and the monster, both are going to be the same subject that we're going to be looking at. Now, as we think about it, there's really a desire in the world today to know if there is something that we can really count on. You know, change is in the world all around us, isn't it? It seems like things are changing every day, and we go to bed one night, and we wake up the next morning, and everything has changed all overnight, hasn't it? There's change everywhere, and there's a desire to know, is there a constant that we can trust in? in this world today. And I believe that there is. We know that materialism has not satisfied. Some people try to run after materialism. Oh, if I only get uh, something, if I get a house, if I get a boat, if I get this toy, if I get whatever, then I'll be happy. But materialism doesn't satisfy, does it? It really just leaves us empty. Others are going after one pleasure after another, but really pleasure doesn't satisfy in the end, does it either? It really leaves us empty. You know, some of us need to have the latest, greatest uh, phone and computer and whatever else, but technology doesn't really fill that void in our hearts and give us meaning, does it? There's a hunger for true, genuine Christianity and to discover the truth and if there is a truth. And some are questioning today, well, you know, that's your truth, this is my truth. That's really contradictory in its terms, isn't it? Because if there's something that's true, it has to be true, right? Now, I believe, as we have studied, that this book is true, don't you? That the, thy word is truth. That's what Jesus says. And this is where we can find our stability and our hope. There is a truth today. And I want us to remember that as we look at our subject tonight. There is truth. Jesus said it in John chapter 8, verse 32. He said, you shall know, what does he say? The truth and what? The truth will set you free, right? So you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Is there truth? There is truth. There is something concrete. There is something that will give us stability in this world. What is that truth? John 17, 17, I already quoted it. Jesus says, sanctify them by your truth. And then he says what? Your word is truth, right? Your word is truth. And so as we look at that, if there is truth, and we know there is because the Bible is thy word is truth. That's what Jesus says right here. If there's truth, there's another question we need to ask. Can we really know, does God have a church today? Is there a church that we can see that is teaching this truth? Does God have a people on earth called his church? You know, there are thousands of denominations. Uh, in fact, some will say about 10,000 denominations. That's a lot, isn't it? And you can begin at a, with the assembly of God, and I'll go all the way down to the Zionist church and Z, and everything in between. And there's all sorts of things we haven't heard of either, like the psychedelic Zenist church. There's one named that as well. I don't suggest going there. But the, uh, there's all of these things, and it can be bewildering, can't it? And you know, something that is interesting is when you go at a church, have you ever seen, you know, those signs in front of churches and a flashing red sign that says, beware, air is presented here. Have you ever seen that? Air, E-R-R-O-R. E -R -R -O -R. So wrong, wrong, something that is not true uh, uh, is presented here. Have you ever seen that? No, you don't put a warning. I've never seen a church that says, warning, we don't tell you the truth here. You could put a sign like that on some churches, but you don't see a sign there, do you? Everybody thinks that they have the truth, 
but yet there's all these different ideas. Well, I believe that God's word is going to help us to understand what is truth and what is a people that has truth today. God has always had a people. Even you go back to Noah's day, you know, there were a lot of people on this world in Noah's day. We don't know how many. But there were a few that got in that ark, weren't there? In fact, there were eight that got in the ark. But did God still have a church even in Noah's day, a people that were following him? He did, didn't he? There might have only been eight out of millions or a billion. We don't know. But there were still some. Sometimes people say, well, why are there so few? There were so few in Noah's day, wasn't there? But would you rather know the truth from God's word with a few rather than falsehood with many? Would you rather that? Yeah, the truth from God's word. You know, you look in Abraham, there weren't very many, but God called Abraham out. And we could go all throughout sacred history. God has had a people. And I believe God still has a people today. But let's turn to Revelation. We're going to begin as we look at the moon, the, uh, the, moon, the maid, and the monster. We're going to begin by looking at the maid. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1. Now a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. So notice the picture here. John sees, and notice what he calls it. He says, I saw a great sign. It appeared in heaven. Was this an amazing thing here? It was, wasn't it? A great sign appeared in heaven. And what was this great sign? There was a woman that was standing on what? On the moon, and she was clothed with the sun. She was clothed with the sun, and she had a garland or a crown, a wreath of victory of, what does it say? Twelve stars. Now, this is really quite a picture, isn't it, when we stop and think about it? Here is this beautiful woman standing on the moon, bright, shining bright like the sun, with a crown, a victory wreath of 12 stars. And then she is with child, ready to give birth. Now, remember, prophecy, Bible prophecy, apocalyptic Bible prophecy is given in what? Symbols. And what do we allow to explain those symbols? The Bible. If it's in the Bible, it's for me. If it's not in the Bible, it's not for me, right? And so what does this mean? Clearly, we haven't had a woman that was giving birth on the moon any time in history that we know about. And so this has to be a symbol of some type, right? So what is this symbol representing? There's an important symbol in Bible prophecy that we haven't looked at yet. So we're going to look at it tonight. Let's review a couple of the symbols we've already seen. A beast in Bible prophecy represents what? A nation or a kingdom, right? So a, a beast represents a nation or a kingdom. What does a day in Bible prophecy represent? A year. So a beast is a kingdom, a day is a year, and a woman is another frequent symbol that is used in Bible prophecy that we need to understand. Now, what is it? Well, let's look at several verses. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 2 to begin with. And notice what we read here. I have likened the daughter of Zion to a lovely and delicate woman. Now, that's interesting. Now, if we were to go, I don't have it up on the screen. I don't think I do, at least I don't. Isaiah 51, verse 16, it says that Zion, say to Zion, you are my people. And so Zion is God's people. And it says, I've likened the daughter of Zion, or God's people, to a lovely and a delicate woman. Now, it's interesting. God's people are represented as what type of woman? A lovely and delicate woman. Now, that's important because when we come to Revelation chapter 17, that we're not spending too much time in tonight because we're going to look at that more on Saturday morning. But when we come to Revelation 17, there's also a woman, but she is not a lovely and delicate woman. And so this is not representing God's people. It's representing something else. And we'll look at that later. But a lovely and delicate woman is, represents God's people. Another verse here, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses two, uh, verse 2. It says, For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, 
For I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as, what does it say? A chaste virgin to Christ, right? Now, who is he writing to? You can look in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 1. He's writing to the church at Corinth. And so to the church at Corinth, he writes and he says, I want to present you as a I have godly jealousy over you, and I want to present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Once again, is this a pure woman? Yeah, and it represents God's church. Another example. This is a symbol that is used all throughout the Bible, so I'm giving you several verses of it here. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 31 and 32. Notice Paul is talking about husbands and wives and their relationship. And he says, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Then notice what he says in verse 32. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning, what does it say? Christ and the church. So what is, what is Paul using to represent the church here? The wife or the woman, right? And so Christ is representing the, uh, the, the groom is representing Christ and the woman is representing the church. And so we see in Isaiah, we see in Jeremiah, we see in 2 Corinthians, we see in uh, Ephesians, and we could look at other places, but God uses the symbol of a woman to represent his church. In fact, we could go all the way back to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, and he's talking there to the serpent. He says that the seed of the woman, the church, will crush your head, and, but you will bruise its heel. Well, that was actually a prophecy of this prophecy, part of the prophecy that we're looking at, that through the lineage of Eve, through God's people, Jesus was going to come and crush the serpent's head. And so what we see is a woman in Bible prophecy represents the church, God's people. Now, when we see this woman standing on the moon, clothed with the sun, this is clearly a pure woman, isn't it? Now, what does this mean? standing on the moon and clothed with the sun. Well, this is very interesting. I want to look at this here uh, just a bit or talk about it a little bit here. The sun is a representation. We read it in John chapter 8, verse 12. Jesus says, I am the light of the world, right? Jesus gives light to this world, doesn't he? And as Jesus gives light to this world, then he is like the sun, he is that. And so here, well, obviously this isn't Jesus, but when we, then it talks about that we want to be clothed in the garments of Christ's righteousness or clothed in Jesus' character. It talks about that in Revelation 19, 7 and 8. Do we want to reflect Jesus to others around us? Yeah, we do, don't we? Do we want others to be able to see Jesus' character shining through us? Yeah. We don't want people to say, oh, Christians, they're the most miserable, mean people in the world. That'd be the worst thing, right? And so we want people to see Jesus' character shining through us. And if, we see G and if people see Jesus' character shining through us, it's like they can see the Son, uh, Jesus, the Son of Righteousness, reflecting through us. And so I think when we see this woman clothed in the sun, it's a symbolic representation of they are clothed in Jesus' righteousness. We don't have any righteousness ourselves, do we? But Jesus wants to give, forgive us our sins and give us his righteousness, doesn't he? And so the church is experiencing the gospel, represented by being clothed in the sun. And then it says she's standing on the moon. Now the moon is interesting. How much light does the moon have? None. But what does the moon do? It reflects the light of the sun. Now, in the night, when you can't see the sun, does the moon look pretty bright? It does, doesn't it? Because it's reflecting the light of the sun. Now, if Jesus says he's the light of the world, is there something that reflects Jesus' light in a dark world when Jesus isn't here anymore? I believe the word of God reflects the light of Jesus, doesn't it? 
You know, Jesus came and lived on this earth for 33 years. That was all the world could handle. And as Jesus was here, we saw God made flesh. That's what John chapter 1 says. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father. John, that's John 1, 14. And so here Jesus revealed his glory. But he went back to heaven. He ascended to heaven. And what do we have now that reflects the glory of Jesus? We learn of Jesus through his word, don't we? And so when we see this picture of the church that has exp is experiencing the gospel, she's reflecting the righteousness of Christ to the world, the character of Christ to the world, and she's standing on the moon. She is, has her foundation on the word of God. Isn't that what the church should be based on, the word of God? Isn't that where all of our teachings should come? You know, it's interesting, and I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but in Revelation chapter 17, there's another woman, and she's not a pure woman, and she's not clothed with the sun, and it's completely opposite of this right here. But do you know what she's sitting on? She's not sitting on the moon. She's sitting on a beast. What is a beast in Bible prophecy? A kingdom, right? This power, an impure church, receives her support from earthly governments. There's something else that she says that she's sitting on. Waters or many people. Oh, impure churches can get lots of support from lots of people. But we don't want to get our support or our foundation from people. We want to get our foundation from God's word, right? And so God's church is standing on the word of God, experiencing the gospel and uh, having clothed in that righteousness, the sun uh, the, depicted by the shining brightness of the sun. Now, this is very interesting because the story is going to continue. Now, let's read how the story continues in Revelation 12 and verse 3. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. Whoo, that's quite a scene, isn't it? You know, imagine that. Here is what John is seeing is this beautiful woman that is ready to give birth and her obstetrician is this ferocious dragon. <laughs> that doesn't make you very comfortable, does it, ladies? <laughs> but that's the picture that is pointing here. What is this picture about? Well, it's a picture of this battle that goes on and is still going on. And what does this dragon represent? Well, we Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. So the great dragon was cast out. Who is he? That serpent of old called who? The devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. And so the picture is God has a people, a pure people, that are experiencing the gospel, studying the word of God, and their belief system is based on the word of God. But the devil is there ready to devour the child as soon as it was born. Now, when we think back to history, did the devil try to devour the child as soon as he was born? Yes, he did, didn't he? Before he was born, he was trying to devour this child. We know the story of the wise men and how the wise men came and they followed the star and they came to Bethlehem. And well, first they go to Jerusalem and the priest kind of grudgingly tell them where the prophecy said the Messiah was to be born. And Herod says, oh, please tell me when you worship the king so that I can worship him too. Did he want to worship him? No, he didn't. He wanted to get rid of that rival, didn't he? And so when the God warned the wise men and they went back a different way and didn't go tell Herod, well, what happened? Herod got so angry, he did one of the most terrible things in history. He commanded all the baby boys under two years old to be killed. Isn't that awful? The devil was trying to destroy Jesus, but God was there, wasn't he? And as God was there and God was protecting him, God sent Joseph a dream and they said, go to Egypt and they left to Egypt. But did the devil stop trying to destroy Jesus after that? 
No, all throughout his life the devil was trying to destroy Jesus. We see in Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4 as well, the great temptations when the devil comes to Jesus and says, Oh, come on, fall down and worship me and turn this bread into stones and throw yourself down from the temple and the angels will catch you up. The devil was t attacking and fighting against Jesus, wasn't he? All through that time, the devil was trying to get Jesus to fall even just by one word. Do we realize? Now, I don't know about you, but it's very easy for me to say something impatient or unkind. The devil was trying to get Jesus just to say something, one thing that was impatient or unkind. That's why he did all these terrible things to him, trying to get Jesus to respond like is so easy for us to do, but the devil always lost, didn't he? Jesus, the Bible says he committed no sin. Never did he speak an unkind word. Until we see the terrible experiences of Gethsemane and the trial when Jesus' own people cried out, crucify, crucify him. The whipping by the scourge. Was the devil trying to beat Jesus there? He was, wasn't he? He was trying to attack him. He was trying to devour Jesus as soon as he was, well, from when he was born all throughout his life, right? But the good news of the Bible story is Jesus always wins. It might not always look like it. Sometimes it might be difficult. It might be hard to see. But that Jesus always wins. Did Jesus win in this battle when the devil was trying to devour Jesus? Yeah. In fact, the devil succeeded in killing Jesus. He didn't. Well, I don't know what he knew, but Jesus set us free by his death, didn't he? And then the devil gets him in the tomb and he tries to keep him there. He puts the Roman guard and he puts the Roman seal there and he stations probably all of his angels right there and says, don't let him out of that tomb. And an angel from heaven descends and Jesus comes forth from that tomb victorious, doesn't he? Jesus beat the devil at every step of the way. Praise God. He won. The devil was trying everything he could do. The devil was trying to devour the child. He was on him the entire way, but Jesus was victorious. Revelation says, Revelation chapter 12, verse 5, she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. Jesus died for our sins. Jesus was resurrected and Jesus was caught up to the throne of God and he is no longer being personally attacked by the devil, is he? The devil lost. That's what Revelation 12 is about. The devil loses again and again and again. The devil lost with Jesus and he's still fighting to try to get us but Jesus wants us to win too, and he'll give us the power and the grace for us to win through him too, won't he? So what does the devil do? He's lost with Jesus. The devil turns his rage upon God's people that are left here on this earth. Satan turned his wrath on the woman, on the Christian church. All but one of the disciples died a martyr's death. And you know the one that didn't die the martyr's death is the one that wrote the book of Revelation. And you know what they did? They, according to church tradition, they dipped him in a vat of boiling oil. Do you normally come out of a, bat, uh, a uh, pot of boiling oil alive? You know, I used to be in Boy Scouts and uh, uh, I was, we would, one of the things we would do to raise money is we would make funnel cakes. Not very healthy, but anyway, this is what we did. And, uh, you know, you put that uh, batter in and it drops in and it splatters. 
And there were many times that I would get oil splattered, and you kept that oil at about 400 degrees. And when that oil hits your fingers, guess what? That's a burn right then. If John is dipped in a vat of boiling oil, let me tell you, it was only divine power that kept him alive. But God still had a work for John to do. And so you know the Roman emperor, he was so angry. He's like, what can I do with this guy? I can't kill him, so I'm going to send him off to this prison camp called Patmos. And this prison camp was where you did hard labor. Now, John is like 90-something years old. Do you feel like you're ready to go work in a quarry when you're 90-something years old? No, not normally, are you? You're ready for a little bit of retirement. But that's where they sent John. And the emperor said, let's get rid of him. Let's send him to that prison camp. And that's where God gives him the book of Revelation. God had a work for him to do. And you couldn't kill him because God still had a work for him to do. And that's why we have the wonderful blessing of Revelation still today. The Christians were fed to lions. They were thrown. They had to hide in the catacombs and all these various things. But Jesus had made a promise. The devil attacked God's church, but Jesus had made a promise. And this promise was realized to be true throughout history. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. This verse has been confused a little bit by some. But let's read it here. But I say to you that you are Peter, which is a petros, is the Greek word. And on this rock, which is petros, a different type of rock, Peter is kind of like a little rolling pebble. But the rock that, that Jesus mentions here, this rock I will build my church, that's like the rock of Gibraltar. Now, is there a difference between a little pebble and the rock of Gibraltar? Yeah, you know, Peter was a rock, but he was a little rolling pebble, a little stone that denied Jesus multiple times, and God was able to use him, but he wasn't the rock that Jesus built his church on. Jesus is the rock that he builds his church on. And so he says, on this rock, on this rock of Gibraltar, on Jesus myself, I'll build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. God watches over his church. Aren't you thankful about that? It doesn't matter if the, if, if the devil tries to dip his church in boiling oil or exile them to some a rocky outpost out in the Aegean Sea. God has a purpose and he's watching his church still. He's watching you and me. And he will not let all the armies of hell overcome his church because God's church is the special object in which he is especially interested in in this world. And so the devil attacks, but God lifts up a standard against him. Notice Revelation chapter 12, verse 16. This is right after verse 5 in Revelation 12 says, And the male child was caught up to God and to his throne. But notice Revelation 12, verse 6. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God, that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Notice what it says. It says the woman fled into where? The wilderness. Why did she flee into the wilderness? Because the devil was after her, right? So the woman flees into the wilderness because the devil is attacking and the wilderness provided some safety for her. It also says that she was fed there. God provided for her there 1,260 days, similar to Elijah. Elijah was in the wilderness for about this amount of time. And so when we look at church history, we see that God's people had to go into hiding. During the first century, they went into the catacombs. After that, we see them going up into the heart of Africa. The Bisnian Christians there. Do you know, I was in Ethiopia several years ago. Wonderful place. And uh, as I was there in Ethiopia, very interesting. In Ethiopia, they were keeping the Sabbath for hundreds of years until the Europeans came in about the 1400s, something like that. For over a thousand years, 
they were keeping the Bible Sabbath and following the Bible there in the heart of Africa. But it was kind of the wilderness, wasn't it? Because they were hiding, so to speak, from uh, those that were persecuting them. You know, in Europe, you can find that the Waldenses and the Albigenses, and there were groups like this that went up into the Alps and were, had their little refuge in the valleys there where they could follow the Bible and worship God according to the dictates of their conscience. You can see in India, there were the, what we refer to as the Nestorian or the St. Thomas Christians. And once again, when we look at them, they're following the, keeping the apostolic faith. God had little groups of people that went into out-of-the-way places, whether it was the heart of Africa or whether it was India or whether it was the mountains of Europe. And there's interesting tidbits of history that we can see. You know, it's interesting. I don't think I mentioned this when we covered the Sabbath. I was in Ghana some years ago as well. And in Ghana, their name for a white person, they would call me this on the streets, Okwesi Broni, that's what they would say. And that means Sunday-born white man. And the reason they would say that is because when the European missionaries and European colonizers came, they brought Sunday. And do you know what their name for God is? I'm probably going to butcher it. If anybody speaks Twi, then uh, you can correct me afterward. But Yonkapon Kwame. Now, Yonkapon Kwame means God of the seventh day. How did they get that? Well, it was from the apostolic church that came down and went throughout the world and came into Africa. And this was here. It wasn't for hundreds or thousands years later that other, these other ideas started to come in. God had a people all over. In fact, you can go through every century and you can see people that are following God and seeking to follow the Bible. The devil's attacking and they have to go into hiding and it's hard to see them sometimes, but you can find them if you look for them. And that's what Revelation is talking about. Notice Revelation 12 verse 13. Notice what the devil does. We've already talked about this, but notice it again. And when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Notice he sees he's been cast to the earth. Jesus defeats him, right? Jesus defeats him on the cross and his resurrection. And he's angry because he's been cast to this earth. He's limited now to this earth. And he begins to persecute the woman, the church that uh, Jesus came from and Jesus redeems. And then verse 14, but the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. Notice the picture here. The woman, God's church, is given two wings of an eagle. Do you remember we saw two wings of an eagle back a long time ago in Daniel chapter 7 on the back of the lion? Do you remember what that represented? Speed, right? So wings represented speed. The woman had to fly into the wilderness. She had to quickly go into the wilderness to this desolate areas. And she was nourished there. She was provided for there. God prepared a place for her, just like Elijah. You remember, Elijah goes before King Ahab and says, there will be no dew nor rain because of your sins. And then he quickly goes to, God directs him to the brook Cherith. And for three and a half years there in Elijah's day, there was no rain, and God provides for Elijah in the wilderness, doesn't he? And God provides for his people there during this time period, 1,260 days, time, times and a half, a time, we've looked at this before, we'll go quickly, a time is one year, times is two, and, uh, two years, and a half a time would, of course, be half a year, which would bring us to three and a half years. And one year is 360 days, two years, 720 days, half a year, 180 days, comes up to 1260 days. We've already talked about this. Laid on you each a day for each year in Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 6, 1260 prophetic days, 1260 literal years. And we've mentioned this in Daniel 7 and Revelation 13. We've seen this multiple times. This is just review. That's why I'm going so fast. So we find that the church was going to be fed in the wilderness for this 1,260 years, and it was going to be nourished from the serpent or from Satan 
for this same period. Well, what does this refer to? We mentioned this on Friday night, I believe. From 538 AD to 1798 AD, God's true people were fed in the wilderness from the presence of the serpent. They were in hiding. You couldn't see them so much, but they were still there. And when we look at the history, it is absolutely fascinating. Do you know during that time in Europe, it was illegal to have a Bible in your language? The Bible was placed on the index of forbidden books in the year, I think it was 1204. Can you imagine that? The Bible placed on the index of forbidden books. Should the Bible be a forbidden book? No. And so these Christians that were holding fast to the Bible, they would sometimes, they would so, they would memorize portions of the Bible and then they would write it out by hand and they would hide it in their clothes. Like I'm not talking about in a pocket. That was too dangerous. They'd like inside the two parts of the clothes. And so it would be sewed into their clothes and then they would go out into the cities of learning in Europe because they had a message they wanted to share of a savior, right? That could give us salvation and peace in this world. But many times they would end up being burned at the stake. They would end up being forgotten in a dungeon for years. Why? Because they had a Bible, because they believed that Jesus forgives their sins, because they believed they didn't have to worship in the same way and form that the state church did. It was truly a period of the church in the wilderness. Up in those Alps, you can still see some of these. I haven't been there, but I have friends that have gone to places like this and seen where they would translate the Bible and write it out amazing, amazing history. They wanted to be where they could preach God's word and live God's word. But something that's very interesting when we think about this here, if you were looking for God's church at that point in time, would it be hard to see? It was in the wilderness, wasn't it? Now there was the state church and it had the big churches and the universities and the cathedrals and the nice choirs and all of these things. But the big cathedrals and the choirs and all of those things that people look at is what's more important, that or the word of God? The word of God. And so these persecuted Waldenses and others, they had the word of God and God says, you're my people, even though you're in the wilderness, even though you're in hiding, you're my people still. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, notice what it says here. I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. Then notice what he says, the pillar and ground of what does it say? The truth. God's church is the pillar and ground of the truth. As an eternal principle, you do not go to the church to find the truth. You go to the Bible to find the truth. Does that make sense? You go to the Bible to find the truth. And when you find the truth, you look for a church that teaches the truth, right? And so what we look for is the truth from God's word. Now, when we look at that dark ages period, that period when the church was in the wilderness, there's a lot that we learn about God's church. God's church is not in the majority. Sometimes people say, well, how come there's so few that, don't, that understand about the Sabbath? Because the way is narrow. That's what the Bible says. But all throughout history, it's been that way. The Jews were just a small group. The church in the wilderness during the Dark Ages was just a small group. You can never base truth on a majority vote. Majority is not where you find truth. It's the Bible that you find truth, right? God's church is not necessarily the most popular Truth rarely wins a popularity contest. God's church is not the most spectacular. God values truth more than architecture. Now, architecture can be good, nothing wrong with architecture, but you gotta have the Bible, don't you? You gotta have the truth from God's word. God's church does not need the approval of popular religious leaders. Truth is truth, whether religious leaders accept it as truth or not. Important principles for us to remember when we think about it. 
And so let's continue in our story here, because when we look at it, we see that the devil continues to attack, but by the grace of God, there are those that come off victorious. Aren't you thankful about that tonight? Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. <clears throat> and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. They overcame him by, what does it say? The blood of the lamb. Can we overcome the devil by the blood of the lamb today? Yes, and by the word of our testimony. We need God's word. We need our testimony. And most of all, we need Jesus, don't we? But there's a group that can overcome the devil, and I want to be among that group, don't you? Now, we have this history from when the devil was attacking Jesus throughout the dark ages when God's people are in hiding. But then we have a very interesting transition. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. And let's read what this says. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. And the dragon was, what does it say? Enraged. What does that mean? He's angry, right? The devil is angry with the woman. Who's the woman? The church. And he meant, went to make war with, what does it say? The rest of her offspring. So now we have, if we were to look at it, the King James, and this is New King James, but the King James says, the remnant. Now, what is the rest or the remnant? You know, we don't go too often to this today, but can, there's some places, fabric stores and carpet stores, where you can go buy remnants. Have you ever done remnants? What is a remnant? It's the little bit that's left over, isn't it? It's the smaller part, of the, but the same as the larger whole, isn't it? It's the last little part. And so here in Revelation 12, 17, here's a remnant, the last little part of the church, of the seed of the woman. And notice the description that he gives now. This is an important description. Here's the remnant of the woman. Here's the seed of the woman. Here is the last part of God's last day church. Who, what does it say? Keep the commandments of God, right? And have what else? The testimony of Jesus Christ. So here's a group who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And this is the remnant or the last part, the little bit, the last part of God's church, of God's people. Two points. Now, we went over to lots of points of this beast power, this antichrist power. In fact, I have gone over in my studies and come up with about 50 or 60 identifying points of this beast or antichrist power. But here, for identifying God's last day people, it identifies them with two parts. One, they keep the commandments of God, and two, they have the testimony of Jesus. And it's this people, this remnant of the seed of the woman, that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus that the devil is attacking. Does that make sense? Why? Because he attacked Jesus. He hated that Jesus kept God's commandments. He's been attacking God's law from the very beginning. And here's a small group of people that are keeping God's commandments and having the testimony of Jesus, and the devil is attacking them. And so God's true church will keep all of the commandments. We've seen that right there. Now, when we think about this, let's unpack that a little bit more. Let's read a verse in James. We've read this before, but let's read it again. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in, what does it say? One point, he is, what does it say? Guilty of all. Now, what, what law is he talking about? Verse 11 tells us right here. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become, what does it say? a transgressor of the law. Then notice what he says in verse 12. So speak and so do as those who will be, what does it say? Judged by the law of liberty. This is too clear. James makes it exceedingly clear for us. Couple points. One is we're going to be judged by the Ten Commandments. And another point, he says, if we keep the whole law, 
but we stumble in, what does it say? <laughs> One point, we are guilty of all. We're just reading what the Bible says, aren't we? Now, what, how does this relate to God's last day remnant? Well, God's last day remnant church needs to be keeping all of the commandments of God. Because if you don't keep all the commandments of God, we're, if we offend in one point, we're, what does it say? Guilty of all. And so it, that means that God's last day remnant. Now, when the church was in the wilderness, they might not have known all of this. But according to Revelation, God's last day remnant is going to be keeping all of the commandments of God, including the Sabbath commandment, right? And so if we are going to be looking for God's last day people, we need to be looking for a parking lot that is full on Saturday and not necessarily on Sunday, right? Right? Interesting verses. I'm going to skip over those. First John chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. These are strong words. Now by this we know that we know him. If we what? If we keep his commandments. Notice what he says next in verse 4. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is what? That's really strong, isn't it? He who says, I know him. He who says, I'm a Christian. But does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. I was talking to a man one time. He's like, oh, this is a very good church. I'm sure it was. He said, there's just one problem. They don't keep the Sabbath. I looked at him. I said, Brother, you know what the Bible says, right? You know the Ten Commandments. That's a big problem, isn't it? That's a really big problem because the Bible says if we say we're a Christian, if we say we know him, but don't keep his commandments, we're a liar. And if we're a church that claims to be proclaiming the gospel, but not keeping the commandments and not leading people to keep the commandments, we don't know him according to what this says. The truth is not in him. And so God's end time church, God's true church will keep all the commandments and have the gift of prophecy among them. They're going to keep the commandments and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, what is the testimony of Jesus Christ? Revelation 19, verse 10. Notice what we read. And I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is what does it say? The spirit of prophecy. So when we put Revelation 12, 17 and 19, 10 together, we see that in the last days, of course, there's other verses that we could look at as well. God is going to have the promised gift of prophecy revived. God's last day people is going to keep all of the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus as well. Now, when we look at those points, and we could look at it more, except we don't have time to look at it more. But as we look at those points, and as we look around today, I am a Seventh-day Adventist today because that's the only church I see that keeps or that matches those two points of Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. Sure, we can ask for forgiveness, for the Lord to forgive us, but what if we keep going against what he says. Yeah. And so we can ask for the Lord to forgive us. He does forgive us. But imagine I had somebody ask me this one time. You know what? I commit adultery, or not adultery, I commit fornication every week. But I ask for forgiveness every time. I said, well, yeah. But don't you think the Bible says that we should allow Jesus to change us as well and to be obedient to him. And so it's the same way with the, the rest of the commandments, keeping the Sabbath. I, for many years, I kept Sunday. Can't really keep Sunday, but I went to church on Sunday. But when I found out what the Bible said, I needed to do what the Bible said. And so that's why, as I studied this, and believe me, I did not want to follow the Sabbath. <laughs> 
I love my church. My family went back to the very beginning and foundation of this church for a, a hundred plus years. I love my church. I believed it was the true church. I had family there. My grandfather had baptized me into this church. But I came to the conclusion when we studied this, I'm, not, I'm just studying what we studied, that if I'm going to follow the Bible, I can either follow what I've done and my way, my church, or I can follow what the Bible says. That was the choice that I made. I want to share a little bit about the Seventh-day Adventist church because, as I've said, it's the only church that I know that fits those categories. Around the 1840s, 1830s and 1840s, there was a movement. It's called the Second Great Advent or Second Great Awakening in American history. And there were a number of people in different churches that were studying, and one of them was William Miller. And William Miller came to the conclusion as he studied one of those prophecies that we've already talked about, the 2300-day prophecy in Daniel, and he came to the conclusion, he did the math, he calculated it out, and he came to the conclusion that this prophecy was going to be fulfilled in 1844. And he believed that that meant that Jesus was going to come in 1844. Now, he was a Baptist preacher. He was, studied this, was a Baptist licensed preacher all of his life. But he began preaching that Jesus was going to come again. Do you know before then, many people had totally forgotten about Jesus coming. And God used William Miller and those that were with him to bring to the world that Jesus was coming. Now, they thought Jesus was going to come again in 1844, and they were disappointed. But as they continued to study, they said, wait, look, something important did happen, but not Jesus coming. And they learned about the sanctuary in heaven and things like that. And they spent time studying the Bible. And as they, this is an amazing history. We could look at it more. But in the 1840s, 1850s, right in there, mainly 1840s. And then as they began to study, they began to write out these little magazines and to send them to other people. And you know, we're talking about just a few dozen people here. Then maybe a couple hundred. And they said, we have to get this message to the world. Kind of like the disciples in Jesus' day, right? Just a few, few people, but they've got to take this message to the world. And so they began taking this message, and they sent this. We had J. N. Andrews, one of the first missionaries that went. And pretty soon, this message from this few group of people began to go around the world. Until today, the Adventist church is in about 212 countries and territories recognized by the world out of about 230 or so, and has grown from that few group to about 22 million right around in there, around the world. It has one of the largest inst uh, medical institutions or medical, uh, medical facilities because we believe not just in preaching the gospel but helping other people and sharing Jesus' love with them through that. This is Loma Linda in California. Here's another hospital. Uh, and school. The Adventist Church has the largest um, Protestant school system in the world. All around the world, different people in different places teaching about Jesus. ADRA, Adventist Development and Relief Agency, goes around the world helping those uh, in need. This is in the Ukraine, uh, not Ukraine, this is actually outside the Ukraine with the Ukraine refugee crisis. Here is when you remember a few months ago when that, was it a few months ago? I don't remember when, when that condo in Florida uh, came crashing down. This is, this is from the, uh, at, really, the Adventist Community Services that was working there. And right now they're more mobilizing to try to help uh, in the, the hurricane victims. And there's ways that we can help in that as, as well. World radio going around. Missionaries around. You know, I've shared with you, I've been in Ethiopia and gone in different places. There are men and women around the world that are simply going and sharing what the Bible says. God has blessed but the most important thing is, what does the Bible say, right? And as I already mentioned uh, to you, the reason that I'm a Seventh-day Adventist is not because I was born as one, not because I wanted to be even, but because I saw that that's what the Bible taught. 
And if I was going to be a part of God's last day remnant people that's waiting for Jesus coming, I need to be among a group of people that are keeping God's commandments and having the testimony of Jesus. And you know, that's not just a privilege that I get to have, but Jesus invites us to become a part of his last day remnant people as well. It's an invitation to each and every one of us. Do you know in Revelation, we haven't looked at it, we'll look at it more on Saturday morning, but in Revelation 17, there's this impure woman that Jesus calls his people to come out of. But he all wants us to come into his last day remnant people. And as we hear Jesus calling us, he's inviting us to be a part of his remnant people. And it's important that we worship together. It says in Hebrews chapter 10, 24 and 25, COVID has done a number on all churches. But you know, the Bible still says, COVID or no COVID, we still need to worship together. <laughs> Here in Hebrews 10, 24, it says, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. We need that strength. We need that fellowship together because Jesus is coming soon, isn't he? And if we believe Jesus is coming soon, we need to be a part of a group of people that are preparing that and calling us to do that. We're going to hand out a card tonight, those that have cards, if you can hand that out. But you know, it's an opportunity that the Lord gives to us to say, I want to be a part of God's remnant people. The real reason that I'm a Seventh-day Adventist today, as I mentioned, it's not because I was born in it or something like that. It's because I've heard Jesus' voice. In John chapter 10, verse 16, it says, And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Jesus calls us. He calls us to follow him. Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice and I know them, and they follow me. Jesus calls us today to follow him, just like he called the people in Noah's day to enter his ark, an ark of safety. So you have your card here. You can just put your name and then put the date there. Notice the first box. It says, I accept Jesus as my Savior and choose to follow all his teachings as found in the Bible through his grace. I hope that's a box that each one, every one of us can check tonight and say, you know what? I want to follow Jesus and all of his teachings as found in the Bible through his grace. Notice the second one. I understand that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has all the identifying characteristics of God's remnant church of Bible prophecy. We've read it today. We haven't exhausted it. There's a lot more we could look at. But if you see, yes, I see that God's Seventh-day Adventist Church has all those identifying characteristics of the remnant church. You can check that box. Notice number four says, I'm interested in beca to, beca to be a part of the remnant church. There are those of you here, some have said, I want to be baptized. Others said, you know, I want to come, become a member. I've already been baptized before. However that works for you. But you know, I want to encourage you to make a decision right now that you want to be a part of God's remnant church. You'll never be sorry. I have never been sorry. 30 some, 30, I don't know how long it is now. <laughs> 30 some years ago, 30 years ago. I've never been sorry because the more I study, the more it confirms my conviction that this is God's remnant church and I want to be a part of it. Then notice the last one there. I'd like more information on how to become a member of the Adventist church. You can check that as well. We have the, the Bible, the, the class, Bible class that will be starting on, uh, on Saturday morning at 10 for those that are interested in learning more. But I hope that each of us can continue to learn, continue to grow, and not just learn. You know, there's too many of us that have too much knowledge in our head and not enough in our heart. God wants us not only to have the knowledge from his word, but he wants us to be living and acting upon that knowledge. I want to follow Jesus all the way. Don't you want to follow him all the way? May we follow him 
We know he calls us. He leads us. May we follow him as he leads us. And I believe he leads us into his remnant church. Let us pray together. Father in heaven, we're grateful for the time we've had to spend together studying your word. We thank you that we'll be able to continue to study. And uh, Lord, you're calling us because you love us. You've brought us here not by accident. We've seen those flyers or been invited by a friend or seen something on Facebook or maybe just driven by the church and you tugged at our hearts. Lord, you've brought us here for a reason. You have a purpose and a mission for each one of us here tonight. And Lord, we choose to follow you. And there are different decisions that are being made tonight, but Lord, we pray that you will give each one grace to follow you. And may we be a part of your last day remnant church that are ready and preparing to meet you when Jesus comes in the clouds of glory. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now remember, Tuesday night, Revelation Made Simple. You don't want to miss that. You can sign up for it. And on Saturday morning, we're looking at Armageddon and beyond. We're continuing the finishing up the prophecies of hope for the next five Saturdays. Is that right, Pastor? So the next five Saturdays uh, at 11 o'clock and then that further study class at 10 in the morning as well. Thank you for H for coming. May God continue to bless you as you study and dig into God's word.